Hello, I'm Brother Branch, your host. I want to welcome you to our prison ministry live stream. Welcome to each of you. Praise God for your blessings on you and your family and all the blessings he's before out on you. Welcome to the Voices of the Shackle and Unshackle, a prison ministry podcast. Voices from both sides of the wall in our podcast we hear from those who have been incarcerated, those who are working as volunteers, those who are working with families on the outside. This is a Christ-centered ministry, bringing hope in Jesus Christ to all those who are working in prison ministry, a population that is forgotten, a population that people just wanna tuck away and forget that they even exist. But God in his mercy and his grace has given us a tool, this tool, to let others know about those, the forgotten, those who are behind prison walls. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Here, God shares with us an important word that we need to know. For the scripture reads, humble, I'm reading from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did their fathers know that it might make them know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. You see, we must understand we cannot make it in this world by ourselves. We cannot make it on our own marriage, for we need the hand of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the light, the light of Jesus. And this scripture lets us know that God's word is relevant each and every day. And so we'll bless. Hi, everybody. I guess uh, Brother Branch is now frozen, but not for long, hopefully. I'm Jody Randisi, and I'm a prison volunteer invited to be on this podcast to share with you the vision of what it's like to be a prison volunteer. I volunteer at a medium security prison for convicted male felons. It's about a, an hour's drive from my home, and I go every Wednesday. I go in the morning to be a participant and a mentor to a Toastmaster prison club. And then I, in the afternoon, uh, switch over to education and I have a room full of 16 hungry uh, inmates who want to learn resiliency training. Now, I do have a, a couple of courses that I teach. I vary them according to you know my interest or whatever. But right now I'm gearing up to do a class called Why Try. Why Try Corrections is all about creating greater freedom and opportunity through positive motivation and information about the essential life skills that sometimes are missing when you get into trouble and end up in prison. It's as easy as that. Uh, so what I do is very important to me. I've learned so much uh, about going to prison uh, that I want to share it with everyone. I'm 
relentlessly trying to find other volunteers, uh, retired teachers, or somebody who could take over, for example, my book club. I have a book club, and I'll show you the book that has been, it's called Total Pardon. It's about, it's about prison pen pals who marry themselves, not once, but twice. So uh, the, the whole overall reaching emphasis on a book club is A, learning how to read. I do have guys come into book club just to learn how to read. We read out loud each chapter and then there's discussion questions. Now the story Total Pardon is not just about prison pen pals. It's about a reversal of destiny that Will and his praying wife, Linda, had experienced. And when I met Will on a trip out to California, it was for a screen a script that I had written. And he and I were on the same, uh, hi, Brother Branch, back to you, I guess. I'll finish this little thing and then I'll give it back, right back to you. How's that sound? Go ahead, finish up. I'll pick up where you are. Okay, so the book club is about sharing and discussing and being together in a group and understanding how hard it is to get sober and get released from the devil's grip when he has you in substance abuse for decades, which was the case of Will. And his wife, Linda, didn't know after 28 years of being separated, uh, they just didn't know if each other was alive. He became sober. He became a Native American advocate. He became a minister and a social worker and sober. And so he found her, actually her sister, on Facebook or MySpace and said, I'd like to apologize to Linda. And that's when 30 years later, 30 years apart, they remarry and they become ministers of the gospel and they live on the reservation and uh, they do food banks and clothing and they minister and it's also a, a recovery program. So when I met him, I felt like, oh my goodness, your story is so powerful because there were seven instances when Will should have died. And there were other, uh, I guess, seven incidences when Linda was woken up by the Holy Spirit and she prayed. And so all these uh, stories are recorded in the book. And now it's become a popular book club for a couple prisons here in South Carolina. And I can't do it all. I'm doing Why Try for Corrections this semester. And so I'm looking for someone, anybody here, would like to be a book club uh, facilitator. These are the things that I do that I know produces results. I see the difference in the guys who come in and afterwards they express things like, well, I wouldn't be here if I had read this book and things like that just makes me uh, so, so heart filled with passion for these individuals who are seeking a reversal of destiny on their own. That's about the book club. Back Amen. to you. Amen. <laughs> so we'll start with just a little bit of how long you've been in prison ministry and how you got involved in it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It was 2016 when someone in my Toastmaster club on Hilton Head Island said, who wants to help out with a prison Toastmaster club. And I raised my hand immediately and said, that's me. I've always worked with marginalized communities, the Navajos, that was my student teaching experience, the inner city kids. I've always wanted to know what it felt like to be the minority. And so when I uh, raised my hand, I, I felt very comfortable inside a prison, which surprised me. And then I saw the great need and it became a thing where I was committed to every Wednesday. And I, I say that to everybody. Once you go in as a prison volunteer, you're going to stay and you're going to enjoy it. You're going to pray for those guys. You're going to see lives transformed. And so when you first went in and um, what was your experience like? Did you have preconceived ideas about before you went in and how were those ideas either the same or changed after you had your first experience of going in? Well, it's interesting because I have a, daily, a devotional called Streams in the Desert by Mrs. Charles Kalman. And on the first day that I went, November 18th, 2016, I wrote it inside my journal, my uh, devotional. Today is my first day at Ridgeland Correctional. And it says, my environment is of his determining. I'm reading this. I'm, I'm go I find myself in a prison house, a narrow sphere, a sick chamber, an unpopular position. 
I'm like, well, how did Mrs. Coleman, mm. Cowman know years ago in 1925 when she wrote this, that that would be the day I went to Ridgeland? It goes on to say that I have been uh, trained to be a tutor to other strong, storm-driven men. And then it goes on. The whole devotional is all about uh, my environment is of his determining. And so that's how I ended up believing that, well, God had sent me. And I responded positively because on my way out, the associate warden said, gee, I wish someone could teach uh, I don't, stress management. It's so hard to be in prison. So mm -hmm. these guys, if they could just relax and maybe something like coloring. And I said, oh, my goodness, I'm a publisher of adult coloring books and I teach coloring therapy for the soul, a new approach to stress management. Wow. That was day one. So again, I just had confirmation after confirmation. Let's do this, God. We've got a plan. Let's go for it. And that's what I did. That's amazing how you heard God speak to you and then you followed up on it without any apprehension, without any issues, without any, let me think about this. You know, I don't have the training. I don't have the background. Is this really the calling that you have for me? Which says that you must have an awful lot of faith. So what is your faith like when you started this and what is it like today? Well, I'll tell you the when you do respond to God and a calling for your life, your purpose in life, let me say this. And, and I don't mean to sound like, oh, I know, but I do know that I have a gift of encouragement. I also have a passion for mm. communication. And so my stepping into God's plan, which was a total surprise. I never thought that uh, the people calling my name would be convicted male felons. Uh, that's another story. But I, I feel like I've learned so much about obeying God, about being in his presence, bringing his presence with me, no matter what's happening, that I, pr that I have to stay prayed up and that I have to be in, in tune with the moment I'm in while I'm at prison. I've never been afraid it's a cuss-free facility, and I've only heard three cuss words, and one of them was me. It slipped. <laughs> but anyway, the uh, the faith that I've had going in and coming out has only increased my desire for everyone to have a purpose like I have. In fact, let me just say, mm. in Toastmasters, we have a table topics question or statement, and you're given a minute or two to speak about whatever it is. And my question was, uh, what what would you have, you know, like Miss America, what, what would you be your platform? And my platform is I would issue everyone in this room and outside of this room a purpose from God, a godly divine purpose. You go fix Charleston's homeless situation. You go up to Greenville and be a minister because I know how good you preach. You, uh, you know, and I pointed out people in the crowd and I said, my my goal and even saying this is, I believe everybody was formed in the womb. God knew us when we were in his, in our mother's womb. He has a purpose for us. So my job as a prison volunteer is to make a connection that is compassionate and consistent and it's purpose driven for not only me, but for them. Now you're at the Ridgeway Correction Institute and you're ministering to approximately how many uh, individuals? Well, it's Ridgeland, Ridgeland uh, Correctional, just in case somebody's looking it up. Um, that's the name of the institution. But um, there's 16 people in enrolled in the Y Tri class. I have a waiting list for every class that I do. Okay. Uh, but I then have wow. 25 people in my Toastmaster club and a waiting list for that as well. So couple dozen. So what is the what is the procedure for an inmate to finally get before you in this class? Right. So that is a concern because favoritism or who I didn't get in, you got it. You know, I didn't want any of that to take place or ill feelings about I've been trying to get some education while I'm at Ridgeland and I haven't. Can I? So I asked the administrative staff to vet and choose for me. And for a while there, I was in the character mm. dorm where everybody's doing pretty good, but they still, you know, received what I had, the book club, the coloring, blah, blah, blah. But 
I said, please send some guys that are just desperate and they don't have any hope or they don't have family or they don't have a, a, mm. a situation going on. Please give me some of those guys. And they did. And I, of course, um, trust their decision and their vetting process. And so there is a waiting list for this. So you, how long is the class? And so I as an inmate find out from another brother that's institutionalized and then, you know, he's all excited about the program and I sign up. So what's usually the waiting time before, after I signed up to be able to be a part of that course? Well, again, that I asked and how long for, is it? Yeah, the class is 90 minutes, always 90 minutes. And and why I try is and my as an educator, I'm involved in music, activity, art, uh, lectures, videos. I, I want to engage every learner. Everybody has to be engaged in whatever lesson I'm teaching, wherever I am teaching. So the class is 90 minutes, but I don't uh, there's no, uh, they're going to wait until next semester. So they see me, they wave, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm signing mm. up next time. I'm like, okay, I hope you get in. I, 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 that's why I'm trying to recruit other prison volunteers is because I have the content. I just need someone to deliver it. And I always pray for the right people to come in. And so far mm -hmm. it's just me. And, and that was one of my questions. You seem to be the, the only instructor. How are you going about recruiting or are you able to recruit other people to assist and lead out in this like you are? That's a great question, uh, Brother Hank. What I do uh, is contact the local Rotary Clubs, the women's groups, and I say, may I be your speaker? I'd like to tell you what's so great about Toastmaster Prison Clubs. That's always a, a hook. So they invite me in to speak and I, I sometimes get people interested in just funding what I'm doing because the workbooks and the books all cost money. And other times they just say, I, I could never do what you do. And I, I appreciate that. I, I was built for mm. this. But can you be a pen pal? Can you can you write in letters of encouragement okay. that pr produce produce gospel results? Okay, that that that's amazing. So you're pretty much by yourself with this as you're as you're going through. And you, you mentioned the cost factors, which is one of my my questions is that to conduct this class, uh, what does it cost you and who helps you with the cost? Well, I am the publisher and the author of this. So my author costs are very low. I don't I run a book club any day of the week. The why try is a for profit company out of Utah. And they have a, a game plan journal, which I believe journaling is very important when you're discussing life changing revelation. Uh, it needs to be recorded. So I paid, I think, uh, $213 for 16 of those journals. And uh, what happened was one of my inmates in the Toastmaster Club and his mother formed a nonprofit. Now, I didn't want to start a nonprofit. I do get that question. Well, I could write you a check if you were not. I don't have no, I have no interest in doing that. So these guys did it and they did it legitimately. I'm very happy to say that we applied for a Low Country Community Foundation grant and was it was received to pay for the costs of Why Try. Yes. First time getting paid for what I do. <laughs> Yeah, it was exciting. Um, yeah, and they're going to yeah. pay for the Toastmasters as well. So I got the grant, and that's what's hel helping me through 2024. Well, praise God for that. You know, that is amazing to to be doing this on your own, and then how God has blessed you to send resources that you didn't even expect it. But you know, your mind was not on the funds; your mind was on doing God's work. And I think sometimes that gets lost in doing ministry work that we sometimes get burnt out. We look at, you know, how can I keep affording this? You know, but how can I get blessed this way? And and so this grant that you applied for, uh, can you give just a little bit of information or the procedure, how you went through for individuals that might be thinking about doing a grant? Well, it's a low country. There, if, if you know Hilton Head, there's a lot of uh, wealthy people here who want to give back to their community. 
And so they have this uh, long standing foundation and they fund second helpings and they fund volunteers in medicine and they they look for programs every year to fund that will affect directly affect the community. And so my pitch was our pitch was we have a program we call improving reentry employment outcomes. And under that umbrella, okay. we said there's two programs we know affects recidivism, finding your voice in Toastmaster and learning resiliency in a class by Mrs. Randisi called Why Try. So did that answer your question? Okay. That is outstanding. Now, my, my, my other question in dealing with that is there is someone and even myself to go into the prison that might be saying, how can I get this into the prison that I'm going to? What would be the mechanics? What would I need to be able to do? What tools do I need? And then what procedure do I, I, I need to have to be able to make this, uh, I don't want to say duplicate, but learn how to do what you're doing so it can, because that issue is across the country. So what would I need to do? Well, first of all, I do want to replicate myself in others because my programs are contained. So I could easily hand off okay. my try. I could easily hand off my book club. I could easily hand off coloring therapy. They've all been contained into an e-learning experience. Even though they're not on the internet, okay. they have tablets. So my procedure was to start with the warden. And warden, we need this why? And have you read or have you heard about the low recidivism rate after in Louisiana? A judge did a study and he found out that, you know, 70% return, but a 0% return after they've had educational training while incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this? And they go, no. And then they consider, of course, they have a budget for education. None of it is uh, funded for volunteers. However, I do have some good news, Brother Branch. I do have some good news. Okay, I'm always reading good news. Why try? Well, it's not gospel centered. Okay, it is resiliency training. It is a, a course that is not up to par. And I'm an education architect. I can take what they have done and take out the extraneous, irrelevant. They have it's juvenile. Some of the material is just juvenile, and the videos don't work, and the music's. Mm -hmm kind of weird. So I, I have an agreement with why try for corrections to take their curriculum and watch what I do for the next 12 weeks. And let me put that into something that can be purchased or put on the Endeavo okay. tablets. That's amazing that they allowed you to, for lack of better words, doctor up their program to meet the needs that you saw. And, I, and I, I'm going out on a limb and saying this, they kind of package together a program hoping they would just do X, Y, and Z. And then you came in and saw, well, if we're able to make this and this change, the impact would be so much greater. Uh, and did, did I hit that on the head there correctly? I think what you, I didn't share this, but uh, why try is really first developed for at-risk youth. And so people would okay. ask me, Jody, why are you taking your show to prison? Why don't you go work with the at-risk youth? Well, I got certified by Why Try in 2010 to, to work with the youth. But then I realized once I got to prison, these guys are just youth, it, youthful minded, and, and they haven't been mentored <laughs> as a youth. And so I'm still doing the same thing, but the material okay. needed to be adjusted. Okay. And I, I noticed in, in uh, one of the things about you that, there, you know, there's membership and there's mentoring. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about both of those so that our audience would understand a little bit more than it. I don't want them to just take away. You go in and teach a course and then you're down and you wait on the next course because there's so much more than that. So talk a little bit about that, please. Oh, sure. Sure. So, well, before COVID, COVID, there were many volunteers that went into the prisons here in South Carolina. In Allendale, they had quilting and beekeeping and sustainable gardening and barbering and pet care and all of that is gone. And either it's something from wow. the top. Yeah, the warden just said, we're not doing that anymore. 
we're too COVID conscious, we can't lock down the prison if someone comes in with a sickness. For whatever reason, I'm allowed in. Uh, I, I just think that the, um, the opportunity is, if you have a passion for carpentry or fixing things or whatever your passion is, if you can fill out a form in SEDC, it's a form and you have to give evidence-based mm -hmm. results and you have to pitch it properly that, and, and outline what it is. Now, if it's a religious program, everything has to be documented because in prison, you have to identify which religion you are and who's, who's going to attend. Right. Right. But the one thing, yeah, the one thing I really like is my book club. I'm definitely announcing at the beginning of the class, I am a Christian woman. I'm going, you're not leaving here until you hear my testimony. And does anybody not have a grandmother or a mother praying for them presently? That's how I start my class. Okay. So if you don't like okay. it, yeah, bye. Okay. I, um, yeah. So uh, the, the religious education that goes on it is usually men, men preaching to men, which I believe in. And I'm, I'm the education czar. Okay. Now, my, my next question is regarding you work with some of these individuals. I'm sure there's been someone that's been released into the community. Have you had any opportunity to work with those individuals? You know, if meet someone on the inside, could be there five years, 10 years, whatever the case is, and now they're out. And have you had that experience and what's that been like? Mm, I can't wait to tell you this. I met Jimmy McPhee in Toastmasters, and two months later, he got out from 45 years in prison. 12 wow. of those he spent in solitary. He was an angry young man, and finally, a prison volunteer named Frankie San, a little Japanese man, came over from his country to our country and ended up in the worst prison, like Angola, very terrible, built in the 1850s. And in 1950-something, he went in as a prison volunteer and opened up the way for all of us to follow in his footsteps. Now, Frankie son would say to each of the men on death row, he, he went to death row, uh, Jesus loves you, I love you. He doesn't care what crime you committed. He will forgive you if you let him, period. And he didn't preach religion. He, didn't, he just brought animals in and opened up a library and continued to love on the men. And that's what they said about Frankie Song. We don't know what you are. We just know you're strange and that you love us and that we should perhaps love each other. And so Frankie Song changed this, the whole environment of what was called Central mm. Correctional Institute in Columbia, South Carolina. His book is called Frankie Song, A Burning Light for Christ. Uh, the documentary that they're doing right now, uh, it's been filmed. It's 70 minutes long. It's called Prisoner by Choice. Frankie San lived inside Correctional Institute for many years, decades, as a volunteer. No, I think they paid him to wow. open up the library. But it's an amazing true story. And I don't know why I'm saying all that. Oh, Jimmy McPhee is now a minister. He is now out on the outside. He got out, released from death row, released from life in prison. And he's got his degree. He's been getting a master's degree in theology. So, yes, I do follow them when they come oh, out and they're successful. God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so having an opportunity to, to meet with him after he got out, what was that experience like from his perspective as he shared being able to talk to you on the outside? Well, I went to a church in Bluffton, which is the neighbor, uh, the town over yonder, and to hear him speak. Now, he speaks in, in many churches all over now. Uh, but I'm trying to bring okay. Jimmy back to my church, and we're going to show the documentary. We're going to charge $5. What we're doing okay. is raising money so it can go into worldwide distribution. But the Kindle book, oh, Frankie Son, is free. So you can read Frankie Son's story, but you have to really look him up on the Internet and watch the uh, free episode. I think episode one is free on the Internet. But the whole 70 minutes is just an amazing story about how the love of God just the love of God just changes hearts. The most cruel and inhumane people are like transformed simply by someone playing Santa Claus or the Easter bunny and coming in with birds on his shoulders saying, I love you. Jesus loves you. He doesn't care what crime you committed. He will forgive you if you let him. Period. Amen. 
So as we close up, my final question to you is someone who's watching this and they said, you know, uh, I'd like to be able to start something like that. How would they be able to reach out to you for guidance to the, the, the company that you're working with? Uh, you know, they're saying, well, I'm not, I'm not a classroom teacher. I've never been a teacher, but this seems so amazing. I'm just so excited about wanting to do that. Uh, what instruction do you give and how would they reach out to find out more information? Great question. I'd be happy to answer that one. First of all, a person who has a heart to make a constant connection with compassion being the driving force behind that connection, you're qualified. You don't have to be a teacher. All you have to do is have something that you like to share, whether it's a book club, whether it's knitting, whether it's crafts or whether it's gospel preaching, there is a, a place for you to fill out a form and pitch it to the warden or the Department of Corrections and say, I'm available this amount of time. I'm not charging for my faci- my my classes. I, I'm covering my own expenses. And how can they resist that? It'd be like, yes, come on in, let's talk. And so that's where you have to start from the chop down, the, the, top, the top down, the warden okay. and the programming. Okay. Well, praise God. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that there's someone's who heart is going to be touched by this and understanding that, you know, there are so many ways that God can use you. So many ways that we sometimes forget that God has blessed us with talents. And with that talent, he's given us an assignment to use that talent to bring others to him, that they may know Jesus. And you are an example of that that others may know that God has given you. As you said earlier in the podcast, you know, I wasn't afraid. You understood what the calling was and then you did not resist it. So I wanna thank you so much for being on the broadcast. I wanna thank you so much for sharing with us and most of all, teaching us that God has labor in us, but he's also given us labor to do. Thank you so much. God bless and we will be in touch with another podcast.